Oh, I mean, that stuff gets ra- that stuff gets raised all the time. I mean, my mom was in yeah. a study one. I mean, I do human subject studies at UMass. They're very uh, strict. And, uh, yeah. and right, my just mom- to let you guys know that we have a quorum now, so I am broadcasting just because. And that's it's good because after. I no. also think I think there's some people, people had in the to wait- come in. People said they were yeah. in the waiting room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, Eleven yeah. people. Yeah, wow, 11. we're that's, popular. That's, that's like a record. Yeah, oh, so, Chris Brestrup. So, oh, sure. and Darcy was in there, but we yeah. have two other attendees. And I'm expecting uh, Mr. Ryan as well. Ryan's there, and Ross, Myra Ross, are there. Okay. Oh, good. We're so popular. Oh, this is exciting. All right. Well, let me get my my little speech out. Um. So are, are, are we set then, uh, Amber? Yes. You said we were, but I just, yeah, okay. So pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, this meeting of the Transportation Advisory Committee is being conducted by a remote participation. This meeting is being recorded to the web and could be shown on Amherst Media and broadcast on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Anybody dialing in by phone can press star nine to raise their hand to be recognized. People with video can click on the raise hand button at the bottom of their screen. Otherwise, I'll look for the real thing. Um, Just just for those of us who don't um, come that often to see us, um, I try to do it by the right raised hands uh, on the screen. Um, And with 11 people, that might be a bit of a challenge, but... um, uh, we'll I I'll try to pay attention for the uh, the electronically raised hands. Right. Um, so so who all is here? Um, because um, I wanted to. Um, Don't we oh, have our so, whole committee? We have our whole committee, right? We have five. Do we? Yeah, everybody's here. No. We're oh no, Marcus. Uh, We're missing Marcus. 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 So I was I was going to point out, thinking of Marcus, that, that you you you've started a trend here, Guilford, that that first Marcus and now Tracy. I don't know, with the backdrops. Oh, this is my picture of the roundabout at um, <laughs> yes, I know. And so so Marcus had a roundabout, and then of course Guilford started with that magical roundabout. That's I, I don't want to say I'm biased towards roundabouts. No, don't but, don't um, sh- sh- right. Um, I don't have any announcements um, uh, beyond um, the um, the um, the agenda tonight. It's, it's kind of it, it, good stuff. Um, I, you know, I would have made an announcement about listening in the TSO meeting and things like that, but I'll let that happen um, when we get into the conversation about those things. Uh, public comment. Um, I'm going to, to ask for that. Um, no, I don't, so Amber, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people on the list, on the participant list. And then you got to go on the oh, right the side, attend- the attendees, oh, attend- Myra yeah. the attendee. and George are yeah. hanging out. Uh, uh, bring, can you bring those, them in, Amber? Mm-hmm. Um, especially important to have them, them in for, uh, for um, public comment. <clears throat> because I, I would want to ask, I would want to say that we're at the public comment after everybody has joined us. Hi, Myra, hi, George. Um, we're, we're looking for public comment. I think um, you're both here for something specific, which I'll make the next item on the agenda, the uh, Pomeroy Village Center project. Um, but otherwise, um, I'm supposed to ask for public comment. All right. Um, so next on the uh, the agenda, we have the uh, marking up our, our pedestrian bicycle plan map. But I was going to switch that with the Pomeroy Center project update um, because uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Myra is here to speak to that. And, and Mr. Ryan is, of course. Um, I know that they've got other commitments le- or, you know, pretty soon hot on this. And so um, the, um, so if that's okay with everybody, um, the, the update in short is that 
that we've been asked to look at the um, um, at the Pomeroy Village Center project intersection uh, to make a recommend uh, make a recommendation on. Yes, Guilford. Officially, you haven't been asked. You will be asked at some oh, point. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, TS, TSO, the chair of TSO, didn't Darcy contact? Darcy, you're muted. So, so yeah, so Darcy sent a note. <laughs> yes, Darcy. Uh, I, I was asked by the TSO committee to reach out to TAC and the Disability Access Advisory Committee and the, dis, the Design Review Board, the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board to ask for written recommendations. So I did do that. The, the TAC reports right now and they're charged to the town manager and the town manager has not received the official request. You can keep talking about it, but please, that's the tax still, your charge still says you work for the town manager. Right. So, so but the, I, I guess I, the town manager, though, was at the TSO meeting, right? And I thought he, yeah, my he understanding was, was he directed, he or he agreed with this, with the TSO following up with the tax. So, um, yeah. the, the, um, um, what, 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 I guess underlying the request, wherever it's coming from and, and whatever status it is, um, is it's we're we're going to we're going to be we have been asked for a written recommendation on on the thing, and I'm happy to to follow up with Darcy and um, um, Paul and whomever to to cross T's and dot I's to make sure that um, we're doing this. Um, Correctly, you know, by, by whatever the the uh, the rules are, but um, for us in the meantime, I didn't want to didn't want to just just begin our discussion on pulling together the recommendation that we would make that we might imagine making on the um, on this intersection. Yes, Tracy. Um. Well, two points. Um, Myra, she has her hand raised. Number two. Oh, she? Um. Number two. I did have some questions um, just about from our last meeting about when and how the TAC would um, provide feedback on the Pomeroy project, because my understanding from the last meeting was that Guilford had suggested that we would do it after the data was collected, you know, and the different options had been more fully explored and that information would be presented to us and then we would weigh in at that time. So. I didn't know so, if that's still the general procedure, but well, th this is this is this is you know what I, <laughs> I imagined. What I, we I would want to talk about tonight in considering our um, how we might make a re recommendation. There, there's a couple of parts to it. One is, um, we we do have a lot of information, a lot of data about different types of intersections, and we could say right now. Um, with with all kinds of backup and footnotes and you know references to, to studies that have been made, what the intersection might best be for this you know for Palm, the Pomeroy's and and Pleasant Street. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, though, is that um, as you say, Tracy, um, the uh, TAC in the past has been uh, very interested in. You know the survey data, the data that that you know traffic reports and and other things like that that would bolster the sort of the generic. This is, looks like the best kind of intersection that we can think of for this spot. Oh, hi, Myra. It's good to see you. Hi. Sorry, I didn't realize the video wasn't there. <laughs> well, um, maybe that's that's that was easier for us to tell. <laughs> um, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't. Mean to <laughs> not at all. Um, and then. So, and then third, uh, the third piece of the recommendation that I might consider making is that um, um, there's been a lot of experience with uh, difficult projects, projects that are as complex as this, not only the nature of what they're doing, but in the nature of all of the, the, the effects that it has and that it will have in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, 
there is a way that um, I could imagine our recommending uh, the process go forward to get to the final answer about whether or not there should be flowers in the middle of it or you know the kind of curving and, and details like that. Um, so um, I wanted to say that um, with, with uh, Darcy and George listening in so that they could um, set us straight on the, the idea, uh, on, the, on the, these ideas, these three pieces. Um, <clears throat> that, so setting aside that maybe there's, there's some, some paperwork that hasn't passed down to us from, from, um, from Paul or Guilford or wherever. All right, Myra, do you want to speak? Yeah, oh, yes. And Myra has, had her, has, has her hand up. So, sure. hi, uh, Myra. Hi. Uh, thanks for having this meeting. Um, so, I will say, for, as the chair of the Disability Access Advisory Committee, I will say that we have been out, uh, we have received outreach from Darcy, um, Maureen Pollock, and I have communicated about it. We have a meeting. Our next meeting is on March 9th. And we plan to make uh, a lot of that meeting into discussion of this intersection. All the people will have the two documents that Darcy sent out, which is your PowerPoint and I guess just text. Um, and so where we have been advised and we are aware of it. So I just want you to know that. Um, oh, Thank you. Um, and and the, the second thing, speaking for myself, um, I will say that I know there's a lot of research about roundabouts and I have this feeling that you're going to choose to do a roundabout, although I personally wish that you would not. Um, but roundabouts have a lot of research, but not about some things. They have a lot of research about uh, being safer because they, the fewer fatalities are associated with roundabouts because the cars are going slower. It doesn't say fewer people are hit, but it does say that fewer people die. As for blind people, as distinct from, from visually impaired people, visually impaired people have an easier time because they can see enough to know a lot about when to cross. For people like me, and I know that I am a very small minority of people, but nevertheless, I am a person and the law does uh, pertain to me. Um, the crossing has to have some kind of, whether it's a roundabout or a middle, you know, a regular intersection, crossing has to have an auditory cue that tells you when to go and it, you know, and where to go. Sometimes there are lights, there are lights now that can tell you where both sides are, or you can have a raised crosswalk that tells you where to go, or you can have a demarcated crosswalk that tells you where to go. So if you stay on this surface and off that surface, you know where to go. The question of when to go is an interesting question. And that's what stoplights and stop signs are for. And that's what pedestrian activated uh, audio signals in, in middle of the road, I don't know what you call that, um, crosswalks are, are for to tell you when it's safe to go because you can, if the, if the pole is installed correctly, you can push the button on the pole. You know that within five to 10 seconds, the light's gonna change. You know that you can cross safely. Sometimes people put um, like rumble strips in the road, but I think there's research that shows that when the car, when drivers see a rumble strip coming, they slow down before it so the blind person actually doesn't hear the blind the, the car going over the rumble strip in a way that they can gauge. But I think there might be research about where to put a rumble strip that would be helpful in telling me when it's safe to cross um, because there aren't any cars coming. It is very hard to hear, impossible to hear bicycles. Sorry about that, my phone is. There, it's impossible to hear bicycles. It's almost impossible to hear electric vehicles. So there has to be some way to know when it's safe to cross. And um, so that's, that's what I want you to think about. And nobody's gonna pull out research about this very e easily because there isn't a lot that's very easy to get. You have to know what to look for. And even if you know what to look for, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a small um, amount of, of research. But I still want you to think about 
people need to know when to cross and where to cross. As for that intersection, it happens that a lot of kids are gonna cross the street to go from Orchard Valley to Crocker Farm School. Isn't that where they would cross? Or do they walk? Well, they have to cross there somewhere. So they're gonna cross from Orchard Valley to Crocker Farm School. Some of them are seven years old. Some of them are 11 or 12, but some of them are little. And if there isn't anything that gives them control over the intersection, I'm very fearful that eight-year-olds might not have the judgment they need to have to know when to cross when there isn't a red light. That's really all I want you to say, but I want you to do research about roundabouts where, where you know, near where kids cross to go to schools. And I want, you know, I hope, and I think perhaps Tracy can come up with some information maybe about the best practices about roundabouts near schools for, uh, for visually impaired people as well. I don't envy you this task, um, but I want you to know that there are two sides to this issue. And there is the ADA that says that you're supposed to do it in the best way possible so that it's universally designed well. That's it. Thanks for Very letting good. me speak. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. The, the um, uh, you know, we understand, I think everybody does understand that um, it, it's, it's, there are a number of different stakeholders and, and, and certainly, um, um, you know, people who have an impairment um, are very important too. Uh, number one, and I think I've said this in, on several occasions and, and we'll, we'll say it again, is that sort of a principal concern that the TAC has is of and for safety. Um, so uh, it's, it's good to, um, it's good to hear the other side. So thank you. Thank you so much, Myra. I really appreciate hearing your perspective. So um, the, um, <clears throat> I don't know um, if there's a, a time when it's best to get a recommendation um, in um, uh, that we can think of. I, I don't know, Darcy, is there, is there a schedule on this at some, some level? Yeah, the, uh, the outreach document that I sent out um, gives a timeline oh, yeah. for, for um, all of the outreach and the, the, the TSO is going to have two meetings uh, that are specifically designed to take public comment on the Pomeroy intersection and they are going to be uh, we, they haven't been scheduled yet, but we believe they're going to be in late March and possibly the first week of April. Um, so we are thinking that the committees who are going to submit recommendations probably need to get them in by our first April meeting because we'll probably be talking about it for a couple of meetings before we have to get our recommendation back to the town council. And remember that the only thing that TSO is looking at is that one question of, you know, the biggest question, whether or not to have a roundabout or a signalized, you know, upgraded signalized intersection. Um, so that's the main question that we want <clears throat> to put on. Um, so yeah, if you could get, get it back by April 2nd, that would get it into the TSO packet for April 5th. Um, that would be best for TSO anyway, um, if you could possibly do that. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the easy, the, the first decision square around, I guess that that is quickly done. The details of, um, of how a round or how a square intersection would look um, that's that would be taken. The, 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 uh, and I'm glad I'm glad you reminded me that it is a question about it, it signalized what I'm calling a square intersection or a roundabout is the decision at this point. Um, the reason I asked I wanted to get clear on the uh, the schedule is because the level of recommendation that we could that I feel that we could make. Um, you know, depends on how much time we have. Uh, in other words, uh, we've done a lot of work on this stuff. We don't know about this intersection particularly. So, 
right now, general data are available to help us make our decision. Um, but if there was more time, and, and there isn't because um, we have only one more meeting, two more meetings, three more meetings before um, the second, uh, before April 2nd. Um, if there was more time to develop, you know, traffic studies, a, the, the appropriate traffic study to do it, um, for instance, um, and the surveys, which I know are ongoing to get the, those data in and, and review them and understand them. So, so thank you um, for setting me straight on that, setting us straight on that. Um, there may be later times when TAC could give input after the con engineering consultant does more work after yeah. June, right? Is that what's gonna happen, Guilford? But that won't have anything to do with TSO. No, I understand, Th thank you. So, so Chris, I saw your hand go up. So and go back I'm, down again, but. I um, will be bringing this to the planning board and I also attend TAC meetings, as you know. And I'm wondering, um, is there going to be more information available either in the form of <clears throat> refined plans on the roundabout and the cross intersection or as Tracy was suggesting before, more data about traffic counts, et cetera, <clears throat> before these groups have to make their recommendation or are we making our recommendation based on the information that we have today? So, so we, the TAC, are, are, are going to have to make a suggestion based on what we have, the way I understand it is what we have today. Um, you know, recalling that there are, <clears throat> there are three significant uh, uh, transportation elements to this, that I see for this intersection. One, of course, is getting the cars through. Second is getting pedestrians across and third are the sidewalks that are going to run along the sides of the road. So, um, um, you know, each of those is going to require gathering a certain certain type of data. Um, and none, I don't know how much of that could be gathered before April 2nd. So I'm thinking that we can, the TAC can only offer based on what we know already. Um, I saw a hand go up. Oh, Tracy, you have to take the turn the mic back on again. <laughs> I am never going to. So like one, one question was just too about um, bike accommodations, like in terms of how cyclists are treated at the roundabout as well, because what you were just mentioning was pedestrians, pedestrians and cars. Yeah. So we do also want to look, you know, I mean, just as we are an advisory committee and we look at transportation from a wider perspective, also thinking about transit users who are in part pedestrians, sometimes bike cyclists, and then also the facilities for bicyclists. Yes, thank you, Tracy. Bernie. Yeah, um, curb cuts. I mean, there's a number of entrances from various businesses and housing uh, that will move traffic in and out of that area. Part of the reason for this whole process is economic development and not being in and being able to prompt the, the further development of that that village section. So one of the things that's gonna that's gonna make or break a, a decision between signal intersection and curb cuts, a signal intersection and roundabout is people's ability to 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 enter and exit those businesses and those 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 curb cuts, those driveways in the area. I don't know that, I, I, I'm guessing that what we'll end up doing is sort of an upside downside assessment for each type of, of intersection and say which way we're leaning rather than giving somebody a definitive um, <clears throat> a definitive response until we, we've seen some engineering data on the whole thing. And we've seen some, some more detailed design rather than what we see now, which is you know, so sketches on a map. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Eve. Hi, um, hello, by the way. Hello. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple issues that got, well, one that got raised when we were talking about the North Hammersmith intersection and one that's been raised by some of the subcommittee's research. 
And the one that got raised by the North Amherst intersection was the idea of sense of place, that how you construct transportation really shapes sense of place. And um, that's going to be really important that um, the folks that live and work there and might want to bring more people there have a sense of how whatever is done to that intersection changes or shapes or promotes that sense of place. And related to that, I would say, you know, one of the things that really came across in the subcommittee when we were looking at multimodal level of service um, is that when you want to when you want to increase level of service for cars, it's just about building the, the geometry that can get more things through, you know, in a faster volume. But for bikes and pedestrians, the thing that makes volume travel more is like an inviting place that feels safe and feels like a nice place to be. And that also kind of relates to sense of place. So I think that you guys as the TAC could, could weigh in not only on, you know, the, the geometry of the, you know, is the bike path going to be passable or whatever, but how do the transportation, um, you know, whatever ways that are proposed there, how do they affect that that place as a whole and, and people sense that this is a place they want to walk, they want to bike, they want to hang out and spend time. Yeah, and, and that that is, that's uh, that's an extension of, of Bernie's observation of the, the curb cuts, you know, how people are invited in and out, you know, whether that's attractive or not is another part of them. So, yes, thank you. Did I see, did I see another hand? So, so, um, I, I like I like Bernie's suggestion, and I'm going to uh, ask the gang, the committee, if, if that's how we'd like to go. To uh, rather than offering a, you know, this is the best or that's the best, um, a um, a sense of the pros and cons for the two, the two, and and I would I uh, I would want to offer pros and cons on the best version of those two things, rather than, you know, smart signal versus dumb signal, you know, small roundabout, bigger, the sort of, rather than create a huge matrix, which is, I don't think would be useful. In any event, what do we think, Tracy? Uh, and I mean, we can weigh in too, just mentioning like our primary concerns, you know, as the project is moving forward. Um, and that could maybe be considered then by the consultant as a consultant is doing their work in terms of analyzing the intersection and designing the intersection. Um, but I do have a question for Guilford, just, just based from our last meeting when we talked about the, the opportunity, the tax, you know, best time to provide feedback would be like when some of the data was available and so on. Um, just because I think that we could comment sort of generally, you know, based on our sense of the intersection as well as what we know about signalized intersections and roundabouts. But any data that we do have specifically for the intersection, such as what Bernie raised about curb cuts and the location of the businesses relative to the intersection and so on like that, like that would definitely help inform our thinking about this particular place. So. Um, I don't know if there's any information that Guilford might, I don't know, like for the public output, I mean, the outreach meetings, like what, what people attending the outreach forums are going to be told in terms of the specific conditions of the intersection. So I, I think for our part of the process, um, that, that's, a, that's an, an excellent idea and fitting it into um, this, this comparison. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm feeling that I would love to be able to take a vote today and say, you know, offer the recommendation, but I think the process that I would like to um, uh, explore the idea of is to, um, for next time, Guilford is to develop sort of that list of things that we need to compare so that we as a committee can go through and say, yes, you, you forgot this thing to compare, so we can add it to the list, first of all. And then second, what is that comparison? How, how would each of these work in the pro and uh, con column? Um, so um, how is that? And, and in the meantime, I guess before the next meeting also, um, I'll, I'll get a chance, I hope, to uh, have a little bit of a chat with Paul. 
to, to get all of that formalized. Um, um, I've stunned, stunned silence. I get that a lot on Zoom. I, I don't know if it's, if it's is, it, is it my transmission? I, I, I don't know, a, any event. Um, I, will <laughs> I will take that <laughs> as an affirmation. And so, so Guilford, we have a task. Um, and then I'm hopeful that by sort of, you know, coordinating, you know, the things that we want to discuss that we can actually maybe take, take a decision uh, next time um, as to what we want to offer um, as, a, as, a, as a suggestion to the, uh, the TSO. Eve. Just to clarify, so um, building from what I think Bernie was saying was as, as part of what you're thinking you're going to be able to get for next time is kind of a view of what it would look like streetscape wise, like for a person going through that intersection, what would each look like? It's like that would be very helpful. Yeah, not, not details so much, but that the potential for having curb cuts in places that make them attractive to creating a town center or you know whatever we want to call this thing, this this village center. Um, does that work better this intersection or that intersection? Um, you know, sense of place, this intersection, that intersection, safety for various types of pedestrians, you know. We just just sort of run down that list. And then um, also I imagine each one of those, or at least some of them, would become objects for further study to understand better. But so that that's that's the idea that I would like to offer Bruce. Yes, I was wondering if, if Guilford has any examples of roundabouts that actually would have crossing lights at the pedestrian areas of crossing. Is it, I think there is to be one on Triangle Street, if I remember correctly, on one side of it, over by the apartment building. It looks like there, that might be installed. Yeah, so, so uh, something which you could press a button and there would be a light just for that one area you're crossing through. Yeah, yeah there's, they're actually letting, letting us use those, the rapid rectangular flashing beacons they're being used at uh, crosswalks and roundabouts now. So you would set it up for just one crosswalk and then move it over, have another one for the next crosswalk as you cross the roundabout. Do, do they make any sound? They can talk to you. Okay, okay. But they're very much, it's very much like a stop sign. Stop signs don't talk to you. Um, you do, like Myra says, you have to be able to sense the moving of the vehicle and be lined up correctly so you know that the vehicle is in your path. Yeah. Or is going that, to- That, that does sound more challenging than if there could be an audio, uh, even a beeping sound or something to tell you that it's all right to cross. Well, you know? the, the, the light will tell you the light is activated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which, okay. which you know, is, is that enough? I mean, that's something that, that I think we would have to figure out. Um, Tracy. I mean, there have been some studies that have looked at the use of crossing signals, audible signals by people who are visually impaired. And it does show that there's like a much higher use of those, like when the, well, like for example, on a um, traditional like signalized intersection, like a four way signalized intersection, people who are visually impaired or blind, like know where to find the crossing signals but in a roundabout that might not be clear, for example. And some studies have shown, for example, like if the signal itself, like if the pole or whatever it's on, like does have an audible cue, then that helps um, visually impaired people use that more often because otherwise they're not really sure where to find that to push it to like flash the lights. Yeah, I, so, I, I, I mean, can There's been some research on that. Yeah, I can see there'll be a lot of work um, for someone to do about figuring out how to make either one of the types of intersections, whichever one we choose, uh, more accessible for people who can't see. Um, but but like a, tra a traditional cross, I mean, a traditional intersection, you know, if it's, if those, like, for example, downtown, right, those are at the corners. Yeah. So right. if you're familiar with them, you know, sort of where they should be. You can get to it, right? And, yeah. All right. So I, I, um, I also wanted to um, um, 
I'm going to stop there for this and in the remaining 15 minutes that, that uh, uh, George and Darcy can be with us, I wanted to, to um, open up the uh, discussion on the Lincoln Sunset Residential Area Parking, um, which I think George is, 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 is hoping to get some, uh, some information from us on, some advice about that on. Oh, George has raised his hand. Oh, yes, <laughs> please. Yes, yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. I, I, I came here really just for that purpose. I saw it on your agenda and I wanted just to sit in and listen and hear what your thoughts are. I reached out to Tracy, um, talked a little bit to her and I hope I can reach out to her later, but um, this is something that I've been working on because it's in my district. We've worked with Guilford a little bit. So I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are um, I think I sent, or a document was sent to you that sort of laid out the background, so I don't want to go through it and take yeah. up your time. Um, yeah. I think you all have had a chance to look at it. Um, I, there are two things that I'm interested in and trying to get clear on myself, and one is a process question. Um, you know, when these kinds of res this is residential requests or requests about parking, residential parking, um, where should they go? Um, and is there a role for TSO in this? That's a question. Um, and what role or place might there be for TAC? That's a question. Um, so there's the process question, what do residents do? Um, and this is obviously rooted in a very specific instance, namely Lincoln. Um, but when TSO looked at it, um, the basic conclusion was, why don't you uh, think about the whole process of the town, not just one particular street? So that's where we're at now. We reached out to Guilford, he gave us some great ideas. Um, and that's the second part of it, which is assuming there is a process and it is in the hands of say a council committee or some other body that was created, um, what would be the criteria that you would use to evaluate these kinds of, re of requests? And then uh, that's the other thing I've been working on. So that's why I'm here and I've got about 15 minutes. So I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> All right, well, well thank you. Um, so um, we saw this particular um, uh, we saw a, a year ago now, maybe a year and a half ago now, um, a proposal for um, for this this area for parking. Um, I, I don't know. So, so gang, uh, what what do you think, Kim? Um, I so, so I am a. Um... I, you know, I am both involved as a TAC and I also live on Cosby and I bike and walk and my children bike and walk everywhere. So parking on Lincoln has been an issue that I've um, dealt with personally and then as a part of this TAC. Um, and I see it as an issue um, certainly to, but for, I see it as an issue for my family safety, <laughs> biking and walking, and even driving on Lincoln is very dangerous with all the cars that park there um, from, you know, they're mainly UMass cars that park on that street, as you know, um, or people heading to UMass. But from the point of the tack, I mean, I feel like, you know, we don't necessarily, I, I feel like when the, these requests first came to our council, I felt like they were slightly out of the purview of our council because they seem more like personal issues that have to deal with personal safety and or, you know, um, I don't like people parking outside of my, my, my house all day long. I get that. I mean, I have to drive around cars, you know, I get that as a, as a, as a town, someone who lives in the neighborhood, I think those are dangerous, the, the parking. But for the TAC, I see it as an issue. I see our place not dealing with those like parking issues, kind of like, like residential issues. I think that's something more that town council should deal with or some other council, not ours. But I think that our place as a TAC is to support the danger of that kind of um, that kind of those those parking issues um, having to do with transportation through those streets, right? We all know that that kind of parking is dangerous for you know pedestrians can't see around 
those parked cars to cross the street. Um, cyclists are worried about doors opening into um, the cycle area and, and it really greatly reduces, it, furthermore, it reduces the amount of street that's available. You know, it's not really a two-way street when there are cars parked there. So then where do bikes go? So I think of it as more of a, a safety and general street use issue for the TAC to voice our opinion about rather than kind of more of the personal residential issues. Does yeah. that make sense? Y yes, thank you. I mean, this is a classic example of a road that was laid out a long time ago and then its use changed and, you know, we're stuck with it. There's no way to make it wider. There's no way to do all the things that we would do with the street today as it became a major commuter route and other things happened all around it. So, Guilford. So, um, Paul did let me, we talked a little bit about this today and there is, based on what George and Pam discussed with me, we were putting together a overall concept to talk about all parking in town and how you would kind of lay it out. Um, <clears throat> There was a memo given to the town manager, which he says, if you want to start using that and maybe playing around with that, that might help you clarify how parking and then the TAC might wish together, mush together and come out with a way of actually saying some parameters. Um, the way it's kind of laid out is that you can, there is some, there is some judgment and there is some wiggle room for local roads as to how you can um, accommodate or decide whether you want to have some parking or no parking. Um, so if you, I can share the memo with you right now if you want, and then you can read it over, but then it's something you can probably take. And we also came up with a list of roads and how it affect each road. Um, so you, we can start looking at that if you want to, or you can wait and do it later or however you'd like to. Yeah, I, I think I, I would would like to take the opportunity to take a peek at that now to begin to move our conversation. But um, just you know, before George runs away, um, I just might um, an observation that I would make is that based on sort of what Kim is thinking, and and she said that before, so that was no surprise. No, we, but we appreciate that. Um, is that there are decisions about how much parking. Uh, you know, you say some spark parking. Well, okay, what's some? And and really, uh, it could be a place. It can be a time, um, and that might be the transportation issue that that I think I would be comfortable in asking us to try to make a make a suggestion on. Um, but the more difficult piece um, will be the um, the policy, the enforcement of that, whether. Um, that it might be a, a neighborhood parking permit required, you know, limited time, you know, you can only be there for a couple of hours, all of those other parking rules, which really are um, mu much more thorny, less technical, certainly, um, but also sort of policy, really policy decisions, because um, they, they, they would affect, could possibly affect, for instance, um, you know, how much money comes into the parking fund. If the decision is to take in to limit the parking to whatever the suggestion might be with parking meters. So uh, does, that, does that make sense? Is that, is that helpful? <laughs> oh. Who is your question to? <laughs> oh, oh, well, to, to everybody, but uh, okay. is gonna take a swat at it first or say something else. I mean, I, I agree with what Kim's saying about considering the on-street parking issue, like in the wider context of the transportation system that we're looking at holistically and like the larger issues about accessibility and safety. Um, when I read the memo that uh, George Ryan and Dorothy Pam had prepared, you know, and they had some potential criteria for deciding about where there should be on-street parking or where there shouldn't be, um, I think, you know, there were, there were some things I was concerned about that I didn't see there, including 
I mean, as Kim's talking about, like with sight lines and things like that, just to, I mean, there is, there are, there can be real issues in terms of particularly in areas with children and pedestrians and so on. Like if you don't have good sight lines, it's dangerous for vehicles. I mean, that's actually one of the concerns that people who live on Lincoln and Sunset have expressed to us at our meetings. And I think right already, some of the on-street parking has been eliminated from Lincoln and Sunset is my understanding, or at least now it's more enforced because now there's like signs along like a good section of both of those roadways. Um, I mean, so there are these like, you know, these larger safety issues and things. I don't, I don't see the TAC being involved in sort of like the day-to-day -day maintenance of parking or issuing permits or considering each one, but I think um, we could provide guidance in terms of like the overall approach to looking at on-street parking and the criteria and considerations that should be included. Um, and I also just, you know, as George was talking about, you know, he asked this question about, you know, where should requests from residents related to parking go? But I think that that's one thing I keep thinking about too, like in terms of the tax charge is some of the larger issues about where should um, resident concerns about transportation infrastructure go? Because, right, so, under our current charge, which is outdated, which was created under the select board, but still in place right now, as, as we've been told, you know, it does say that like we will we will be collecting those like side rock will crest and cross rock will crest and all these well, anyway, that's one interpret that's one interpretation of the charge. It says um, that the TAC will designate who does that. Okay. So but I think that but I think that those are still some of the larger issues about that it, it really should be a more straightforward, you know, flow chart approach where people know, and it is, you know, there are a lot of different committees now and so on too, but where people know if they have a concern, if they want something to be considered, where do they email, send it in, and how does it go through the system? And when, who is taking the action and making the recommendation and what's the time frame for that generally and those kind of things. So those are some bigger issues, I think. Yeah, so in our initial work on, on how, how we take in requests and suggestions, we understood, we didn't define, but we understood that there would be different shoots that each request might go down, different processes that each one might trigger after the decision was taken about exactly what the request was for. Um, I guess but, I'm seeing that here too. But, um, again, but, you know, there are two parts to parking. One is where, and then the other part is the policy. How is it regulated? Yes, Tracy. I mean, but those what you're what you're saying about kind of like the procedure, like the flow chart, if you will, of it, like we that isn't really well documented yet, right? No, no, it's not. We haven't. We yeah. have not um, sort so, of finished that I mean, work. That was set that, aside when. This pandemic thing happened and we haven't really picked that up since. I mean, I would like, to, I do think it is valuable to think about the Lincoln Sunset issues like in the larger context, right? Because why should there only be, you know, an approach in one neighborhood? Obviously, other counselors have heard about other neighborhoods. A lot of people can be concerned about on street parking. Um, and this may come up even more, you know, now that there is more um, residential development denser development that's happening without off-street parking and yeah. the town has now eliminated um, the ban against overnight parking on most of our on-street on -street parking except for like in the snow emergency and so I mean when you have like large snow piles and things too like that can affect the safety as well so thinking about it in the larger. So I think to sort of try to answer that question about what the process might be um, I'm going to maybe sort of make a suggestion as to where we might go with that. Again, going down these two roads is certainly, I think we could advise and we might ask to advise on the technical. How close to an intersection? Can you make a rule about nobody parks within 20 feet of an intersection? I know that's typically done. I don't know that we do it for as, a, as an example. Um, um, but uh, as far as whether it's overnight, whether you need a permit, whether there should be a parking meter, how much the parking meter should be charging, um, that's stuff that, that I don't think we, I, I would feel comfortable for us to, um, to engage in. 
um, and then sort of taking that to frame what our response might be on the on the the, um, the Lincoln Avenue sunset, that it would be along those lines, one side, two sides, here, there, not there. Um, and um, your point is well taken, Tracy, that it would be nice if we could apply this or figure out rules that apply generally. Um, unfortunately, or depends if you live there or not, I guess, um, it might be fortunate that Lincoln Avenue is really different. It's, it's pretty unique. I mean, there, there are three or four more streets nearby that are very similar to it in that the layout is very narrow, that it has become just over time a, a major commuter route to a certain institution that is at the end of it, that, that was allowed to put parking any event uh, in the middle of our residential neighborhood um, and um, has you know developed a neighborhood around it. So I mean, it's, it's other neighborhoods have similar roads, but not the university hanging at the end as an example, or the roads that are, are too narrow. I mean, I don't think the road is even, even without parking is actually meets the current um, requirements for two-way traffic. So, um, so that I guess um, that that's what I so so George I guess that's what I'm going to suggest that we the uh, the TAC move towards if that if that's helpful which is to figure out the where and the what and not the how for the parking here there not there um, is, uh, is, does that help <laughs> well I, I think. The committee member has her hand raised, so I'm going to shut up. Well, no, I, I asked you first. I saw Eve, and I'll I'll, I'll get I'm there. I'm not a committee member, so. Committee member. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I the said bottom, George first. The bottom line for us is that the decision, some the Lincoln decision, is ultimately made by town council as keepers of the public way. Yep. And that's where the decision finally ends up. And um, they need help. We need help. And so um, we certainly look to tack and to Guilford and a whole bunch of other folks to help us. The question becomes, I mean, if you live in, in this neighborhood as, as Kim does, um, you know, you, you, you raise this issue, um, you eventually came to TSO um, it, and it went to the council and the council sent it back to TSO. So nothing's been decided. And, and the, the basic point was you TSO um, come up with something for the, the whole town, not just for one street. And that seemed reasonable. And that's where this whole, that's where we come. Uh, we're trying to figure that out. We're trying to figure out, okay, if TSO is the one that will make the recommendation to the council about these kinds of residential parking issues, it's gonna need help. And some of that help we would turn to TAC. Obviously we rely an enormous amount on Guilford and, and DPW, but the bottom line is that eventually something is brought to the council and they make a decision or they don't make a decision. The select board made a decision a few years ago where they accepted part of what DPW suggested but didn't accept at all. And now this has come back again five years later and the residents again are saying, we don't want parking on this street, many of them, not all of them, between eight to five, Monday through Friday, because it's basically become a parking lot for UMass, create safety issues, blah, blah, blah. So there are a whole host of issues that this raises, right? But the bottom line is the council has to decide and so TSO's role is to advise the council on what they think should be done. Um, and we did. And they sent it back to us and said, we're not ready to decide about Lincoln. We want you to think about the larger issue. So that's why I'm reaching out to you. That's why I'm reaching out to Tracy. That's why we reached out to Guilford, trying to, uh, as TSO, come up with a um, process that could be applied to any kind of residential parking complaint issue and then go from there. Um, and part of that also is then deciding what the criteria would be um, for TSO to apply when they're looking at this. And part of it would be consulting TAC and seeing if you have anything to say. Part of it would be, most of it would be looking at this laundry list and saying, okay, criteria X, Y, and Z, does that apply here or not? And then finally coming to a judgment and then sending that to council and then council would decide what it wants to do or not do. Um, right now it's, it, well, Guilford can speak to this because he's been doing it for years. These things come to Paul, they come to Guilford, they get dealt with, they don't get dealt with, whatever, right? So from the point of view of just a political creature, 
This came to me because my constituents were complaining. They said, this is a problem. We want you to do something about it. Um, and so for other councils in other districts, when this arises with residential parking, do we send everybody to Paul, we send it to Guilford and, and just, and that could be the answer. That's it, they deal with it. But in the end, it still has to come to the town council and they have to approve any change to the public way. So the thought was let TSO deal with it. Um, and then it goes to the council and the council decides. I'm sorry, the, yeah. yeah. So, so Kim, I'll, I'll get to you, Eve. Um, so um, I think that, I mean, our, I, I feel like what we have decided as a group and the precedent really is um, for Lincoln in particular, right? We have, yeah, we have experienced lots of requests from various parts of town to um, slow traffic in residential neighborhoods, for example, um, counselors. And, and the issue, I, what I've seen, and this happened before I was part of this, is that magically, you know, we've gotten speed bumps on Lincoln and Sunset. And I think the reason for those speed bumps there is, is first of all, it was a legitimate concern, you know, cars used to zoom right through this neighborhood prior to the speed bumps. I'm sure they do that on other residential, um, in other residential neighborhoods. Um, but, but, but Lincoln is a very special, Lincoln and Sunset are very special roads. So I'm not sure, you know, I, I, I like the idea of, of providing um, overall guidelines for the entire town, but these roads in particular are very different than many um, of the other residential roads. So, so while I, I appreciate your like the desire to have an overall like parking i you know rules that apply everywhere i would suggest that lincoln and sunset are very unique in town for example which is how we've dealt with these these situations one on one because because so i think parking on lincoln just like the speed bumps on lincoln are unique to lincoln and potentially sunset for example. So I'm just throwing that back at you because yeah. I agree, we would all love to have like rules that would apply everywhere, but it's different. Kim, I can tell you from painful personal experience yes. that there are a whole bunch of counselors who do not agree with us. So they don't see Lincoln as all that special and they really do want to see some kind of broad general policy um, before they yeah. act on anything. And that's why, I'm, that's, that's yeah. why I'm here. I understand that, but like, like we've, we've been dealing with this for, you know, I don't know how long we've been doing this. I've been doing this for maybe five, six, seven years. I don't see that as a universally applicable, like rules. Cause we have, like they said, we have the major, you know, you, you and I, we have the major employer and the major like traffic generator at the end of our street. We, we may find similar instances, I'm thinking of Heatherstone, yeah. which while they don't have an employer, they do have a highly trafficked destination. So, yeah. so um, Bernie, I see you, and I'm gonna have Eve take her turn because I already put her off once. Yeah, there is the mute button. Are you done? Oh, you're done. Sorry. So uh, part of me was just wanting to be sort of a facilitator type and say like what I'm hearing TAC members say to some extent is um, that you guys support uh, the TSO and kind of developing process and developing some criteria and you guys would like to weigh in on that but don't feel like you need to be the leaders on it. And, but that also probably when specific cases come up there, that you would also like to have the chance to review those specific cases to make sure that other kinds of transportation issues are being addressed. So anyway, I just sort of felt like maybe that was a, um, hopefully a summary of what a lot of people have said. Oh, you're good Eve, thank you. Bernie. Yeah, I want speed bumps on Southeast Street. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, you know, I've yet to see a set of regulations or protocols that haven't been written without a waiver provision in them because my experience in the world is the best you can do is 90%. The other 10 is gonna be up in the air because there will be some special circumstances. So I'd suggest to George that the proposed, the list of pro proposed criteria he has in the, the, the uh, uh, 
in the memo is pretty good with the exception of adding in sight distances. I think that's, uh, that's a critical piece. Uh, but once you get those criteria, beginning to set some parameters for them, and then yeah, there will be, there will be special cases. And um, uh, that's unfortunately the job of the electeds when you, you get to sort out the special cases. So that way you would get a set of standards for the town for parking uh, that could be applied in general. But you know, always keeping in mind that there's going to be, there, there will be an odd circumstance or there will be a special case that, that, that pops up and, and people should be able at that point to demonstrate that those uh, criteria don't quite fit this case and they don't quite fit it in a significant way. And then you can make a decision to, to, to modify them for that particular instance. So that'll be the last, that'll be the last thing that on the thing or, or something else, right? It's make all these criteria and then or something else. Oh, good, all right. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, Tracy. I mean, so in my mind, and I don't, I live near Lincoln and Sunset and I walk on them a lot, but I do think that Lincoln does have specific issues just because of its length. And that also because some people are cutting through from Route 9, like across Amity, like all the way to the university. So it is like a longer street than Sunset for that. Um, but uh, I think, I mean, one, one thing we could think about too, and again, this is getting more into like the specifics of policy and, but there was a downtown parking study, you know, that did a lot of inventorying of parking. And it does seem to me that and I don't know the data as well on this, I'd have to look at the parking study, but in terms of, and this is definitely not something that the TAC would look at specifically, but in terms of having residential parking permits, that, I mean, there are a lot of neighborhoods adjacent to downtown um, that do have like residential permits, like even streets that are off of Lincoln, such as Fearing and so on, that only residents are allowed to park on those streets like during certain hours. Um, so, uh, and we're, so we're making, we're making George late for his next meeting. No, but anyway, um, but I think that that, I mean, that to me, like in terms of a downtown issue, like that seems like that's relevant too. like if you're located near like these large destination sites, the consideration of like the permit parking program, which is definitely not something that the TAC is going to like delve into so, the details. But I would like to offer then before George goes away to answer his question is that yes, um, I think that that we could offer some suggestions as to considerations that ought to be made when reviewing a, a, a parking change request. Um, and I think that sort of, I mean, I think one could make the observation that there are going to be elements that are similar in various places, but they're all gonna be modified by other circumstances. Um, and we might try to figure out a way to, to address that as well. So, I mean, the, the, the similarities between Heatherstone and Lincoln is that they're, you know, people, a lot of people use it. It's a residential street. It's intended to be a residential street, but it has become an artery. You know, that, that, is, that is a common thing. And then, you know, that, that raises a set of issues which might be similar. Um, that's not going to be the case for, um, you know, certain roads in, in the, the Flowers neighborhood in the Amherst Woods. So, um, so I think I'm going, I'm going to um, say, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll take a crack at that and see what we can offer you. Well, what I'm gonna, I do have to go and I apologize. Um, I have a different meeting tonight and, um, but I appreciate this very much. It, it's a complicated issue, um, but I think what, I would suggest is that where you could be helpful to us at, at the moment are in two ways. One is that um, when we finally craft a set of criteria that we would submit that to you for your review as a committee for any final suggestions, changes, whatever. Um, and secondly, if a process does get created, which I, I have no confidence that this is gonna happen, but if a process does get created and it does reside with TSO, that we would be consulting TAC in every instance for their input, so whether it's Featherstone or, or, or Lincoln or whatever. But I think before, um, I mean, you will decide what you wanna do as a committee for sure, but perhaps you might want to wait until I can send you something 
that is a little bit more polished in terms of at least the list of criteria that we're considering as what we would use. And you could look at that and discuss it and give us some feedback on that. Um, and then I'm gonna reach out if it's okay with the chair and okay with my chair, who also happens to be present. I was hoping to talk to Tracy in more detail um, and uh, working with her, um, hopefully have something crafted or at least get her input. She doesn't, she's not committing her time to this, but uh, I could use some thoughts from her and then send it to you guys and get your input. In the meantime, I'll be reaching out to Guilford and we'll see what, what his thoughts are. And then TSO will have to decide what it wants to do. Um, so that would be the best thing I would suggest. Rather than having you go off and do something right now, I would suggest you wait until I can give you something more specific to chew on. And I, I'm, what I'm hearing, and you can come back to me later if this is mistaken, but that um, wherever this process resides, it will not be with TAC. Um, you are an advisory body um, and, and a very important one, but the, the task of, of making these recommendations and um, to the council and the council is finally deciding on them is, is for someone else, it's not for you. Yeah, so Tracy's chair is perfectly comfortable with all of that. So yeah, thank you. I mean, I do, <laughs> I mean, I will say just to weigh in here as I'm being can, um, <laughs> um, offered out, but the, um, so one thing was when uh, George and Dorothy Pam like put together their initial proposal, I did provide some comments at that time to them in writing and to the TSO on the criteria. Um, and I'd be happy to clarify that. Um, I, you know, I do think that we have a number of TAC priorities right now, um, including the work of the subcommittee and Pomeroy and so on. So I, I would like to see, I mean, I'm happy to have a conversation with George um, and then you know, I think we need to move on some of these other projects. I think it would be really valuable. Um, Guilford had mentioned a memo that Paul has related to parking, um, and it would be really helpful to see that. I, I wasn't clear from Guilford's comments about who wrote the memo. He just said that it's like Paul has it. So I don't know, Guilford, was that from DPW to the town manager or, okay. So, I mean, I think in thinking about this, um, I know the TSO had been waiting for input from the DPW you know, on the proposal. So um, I think, you know, just moving forward, it would be very informative to see that. And you would offer, if you could like make it available, that'd be great. So, so good, thank you, George. We will do that. Um, 15 minutes for professor. So you still got one more minute before you get to your next. Uh... <laughs> thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> Take care. Thank um, you, George. All right, um, I would like to, to back up then to our, um, um, our pedestrian bicycle plan map markup exercise. Uh, Tracy, are continuing. I have a question about just our um, agenda for tonight and the time frame of it. So I know um, George was leaving to go to the district five meeting. I, I mean, district three, sorry. And I do live in district three. I would like to go soon to that meeting as well. It starts at 630. And just I know we usually try to not have our meetings go too long. It did seem like there were some other items on the agenda. I don't know whether it makes sense to go through those and leave the bike plan markups till next time. It, Marcus did have really valuable input when we were going through the markups at the last meeting. Um, um, and he's not presently here. So I don't know if he's provided his comments like in another form, but I thought he he really seems like he knows a lot of the roots. Yeah, I I, I I have not seen anything. I don't know if he sent something to Guilford or Amber. Um, uh, no one sent any comments yet. So um, and uh, and and even I also wanted to provide an update on the subcommittee too. So, so we, we, if 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 we get you out of here at six thirty, that gives us a little under fifteen minutes. Well, I mean, so, I do, it doesn't have to be um, then. I just I just know that we were like like last meeting, we spent you know a good seventy five minutes talking about the map, and so I do want. Well, I was going to limit it this time, but the other <laughs> that away. So Kim. Yeah, I I I concur. I mean, I I think we can take a big chunk of the next meeting to do the map. I think we should get on to any other business that we have because I think fifteen minutes isn't enough to really yeah. make a dent in the map. So um, then, then uh, let's jump down to the committee comments then indeed. 
Tracy, you, you, you have something for us. Oh, um, well, I had a few just follow up items. Like one was, um, Aaron, you had talked about, well, there were two things from last meeting. One was you had mentioned that the priority list had um, that Guilford's list, you know, of the priority future yeah. projects had been submitted and was available on the website. I had looked on the website and I never saw it there. Can you tell us more about where it's located? I I don't remember where I found it. Um, it's been a while since I went to look for it. I will look for it again. And um, I will also offer an apology that I have not edited it to make it put it up on the front page yet. As I said, I might, I would. Um, so I will be doing that so that it, it's, and the intention um, is to bring it up onto the, um, that right-hand menu with the major um, documents that we have. So that, that's, that is where it's going to go. Where it is now, I can't say what form it is. I know it's not good. Um, and I'm gonna change both of those. Oh, okay. Um, and then also at the last meeting, um, you and Guilford were going to draft a letter to Mass DOT related to like Hadley and Route yes. Nine. And so I, I've been away at meetings all this week and last. No, of so course. I, all right. I, I didn't get a chance. I'm sorry about that. But yes, that that is something that that we will do. Um, and I have good notes about our intentions that it's going to be to support DOT and not be in opposition to any other suggestion that might be floating around from someplace else. Right. So I had looked on the uh, Mass DOT website for the project, you know, and just reading a little bit more about the project. And it didn't actually, I didn't see any, and I also looked through the DOT like current project list, both the design list and the current construction list, and it didn't actually mention bike lanes specifically. Um, it just says that they had agreed to provide like shared paths for pedestrians and cyclists along the corridor of the construction. Um, so I am a little curious about what the Hadley Select Board was responding to in making their specific comments on the bike lanes. And um, But what the Mass DOT website says is it says that the project is at 100% design and it's currently been submitted and is like being reviewed. But yeah. I cannot find specifics on the website about those types of details. So. I mean, maybe we so, keep our letter general and we just say that we support it as like part of a continuing corridor and it connects us to other communities. And that's, we, that's we support the intention right now. Bike and pet. So uh, I'm, the, the detail is interesting. So I, I, whatever the detail is, I think that's all that we should really say. Not, <laughs> no, nothing, not too much more. But but Guilford, I have seen those drawings and I don't remember what, what they had for bike lanes. Um, uh, where would that where would we see those and, and maybe maybe we can find those don't have to answer that now but let me let I, me uh, i mean i attended a meeting in hadley when yeah. it was i think it was like 50 percent design and it was sponsored by one of the business business people in hadley and so on um and that was the meeting too, like where the Mass DOT planner, Mike Trepanier, had all these grand plans about all these street trees and so on, and where the business people like X them all out <laughs> for the most part. Um, but I haven't, I could not find like those again on the, um, on any website or anything. Okay. Well, when I looked, but. I'm, I'm sure we can find it and, and we might even be able to get it from our friends and colleagues over in Hadley. And then, so like, just um, we so, have very good plans for the Northampton Road um, work. I'm sure similarly, similarly good plans exist for the um, the Russell Street work. Okay, I'm going to be hopeful. I'm going to be hopeful. Um, so even I did meet with. Um, do we did talk to the PVPC about complete streets and complete streets plans? Um, and uh, we also met with Guilford <laughs> and we also met with Guilford so thank Guilford for meeting with us and he gave us great feedback um and and so did PVPC we talked with Jeff McCullough um so it sounded what 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 we were talking about is one thing and I know Guilford has talked about this as well in terms of a consultant and I did take um 
a bigger look at some of the different complete streets plans that have been adopted and approved by MassDOT on the MassDOT website is that some of the documents like I was looking at Northampton's is one of the things they do and, and Guilford has talked about this as well is like had a list of specific projects that they want to put forward as well like that include like cost estimates and like different details for each of those projects. Um, Jeff McCullough, when we were talking to him, he did say that some of the lists that get submitted as part of the complete streets plans for different communities can be, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 or even, I think he said Hadley had like over 100 projects listed, um, but it's important to get them on the plan, like included in the plan and in the mass DOT document. And if, like he gave an example of a town that, I mean, a city that chose, you know, like say, project that was like number 26 on the list and that could still would still then be eligible for future complete streets funding as long as it's in the plan. Um, so even I are still interested in continuing to um, reform some of those scoring matrix, but it seemed like a really important component. And this is what Guilford has said as well is the list of projects. Um, so I know Eve wants to talk to, um, but one thing that I had been thinking about with that is I know that on our major project list, the one that we've reviewed with Guilford, not just the list of neighbor um, requests, but the one in terms of like capital planning is that I don't think our list has more than say like 10 or 15 projects that, that may be particularly as, and maybe as part of the bike and pled um, when we're going through the map too that really start to look about if we want to build out the list and include more projects in that. So. Um, I just, I wasn't sure that people who haven't been in the weeds like we have understood all of that. So I, I just wanted to step back a little bit and and um, sort of give the 10,000 foot view. Thank you, Eve. Bit. Sorry, <laughs> I was in the weeds. I'm a detail person, but okay. Um, you and I can both be way detailed, but. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but I'm going to try to, to refrain from that for right now. But so the idea is that, as you guys know, the subcommittee has been involved in trying to come up with this process for scoring projects, right? And in the process of getting there to have a system of um, ranking level of service. The basic idea is that is going to bifurcate at this point from this process to get a bunch of projects listed in what the state calls a prioritization plan. Right. So there are two prioritization plans. They're going to sort of go their own way to some extent. Both Guilford recommended this and the PVPC recommended it. And after Tracy and I talked to them, we support that idea. So the subcommittee can continue trying to really hammer out the details of those numbers and our sheets and everything. But in the meantime, the task that needs to go forward with the state is to basically get a list of every project we might ever want someone to pay money to build in Amherst and get that list to the state. And that's what Guilford is basically gonna hire this consultant to do. The consultant can take what we've done and use it to the extent we have it, but also they have their own systems that they've developed working with other towns. So I think at this point, what we would ask the TAC is to basically um, support Guilford's move to hire a consultant and move forward with that. Support Guilford, oh, I don't know. Um, how? how how much of, of that work might already be on the list, our, our little project list? Just out of curiosity. It's you mostly know. the big projects. So the ones that um, you've recommended to move to the big list, it's like um, um, East, East Pleasant Street um, sidewalk. And I think, what was the third one? Oh, I mean, there's like pot wine right, and Birth Pomeroy Birth Lane and... Pot right. wine, the pot wine intersection, the Mill Street yeah. intersection, and the Amity, oh. like Amity um, University Drive, and I mean we could, we can There's add a lot of those. Yeah, is that, yeah. That, is that is that what this this list is looking for? This, this the list state? Is, so what what we have heard from everyone at this point is we want to get everything on our possible wish list for the next twenty years into the list that goes to the state. So the all intersection the Pine Street and another forty seven things that we might. Uh, but and that's where even well where I had been thinking too that as we're going through the bike ped plan, I mean the map, you know, we're looking at the different parts of town, including Southeast Street and so on. Like we could talk about, you know, should they be on the list too? 
This is where identifying the current gaps in our network. But you need to have the you need to have your plan thought out enough that you can estimate it to get it on the list for Mass DOT. Makes sense. And I don't think we have to, I don't think you guys, the TAC has to do that right now, right? The TAC can focus on finishing the PED bike plan. Consultant can look at the PED bike plan, work with Guilford and, and come up with a draft list. And then the, the TAC can say, oh, you forgot this, this, and this. Okay. And the, same, the same for the intersections, I guess. You just say, um, and when, how, how much detail, how much work has to be finished in design or planning to get to the level of estimate that is adequate for this list. Most of I mean, it's already done. Wanted... Huh? Most of it's already done. So oh. what Tim told us yesterday was that basically there are two projects that are at the top of your list that you really you know, cost out in detail and then the rest are just very, very, very approximate because you know they're not going to get funded for a few years anyway and the state's used to that and it's okay. That's what he told us yesterday. Okay, right. So like for Guilford, so say there's an intersection and like, I don't know, pot wine or somewhere and we're not sure how the project would be built out, you know, or how it could be redesigned or even, I mean, do you think that we would need to make a lot of detailed choices about there or as Eva is saying, can it be kind of more general about like it's more general. Okay. So so and, and pot wine, I think we can already be pretty specific, but mill mill lane we couldn't because we don't know. We know more than you do. Oh <laughs> always you always yes. <laughs> what are no, you holding out on us, Dilford? Yeah. Mill Lane's Mill Lane's pretty much conceptually kind of laid out. Oh, we good. Less than cost it out, though. So, Guilford, if we add all those types of projects onto the list, like they didn't seem like they're on the list that we've reviewed before, like the big project list. Like, how many projects do you think that there are those kind of conceptual plans for them at this point? There's probably about twenty. Okay. I mean, so I guess that would be a question, you know, would we want to, as Jeff was suggesting, Jeff McCullough was suggesting, would we want to like expand the list to say 30 or 40 or something just to put them all in there? I don't know. And, it, and is that realistic with the consultant? So, yeah, the goal, the goal is to get the 20. We, I mean, we have a good solid 20. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Get those done, get that approved, get the, con, get the, methodology for how we rate the projects finished and approved and then submit that to mass dot to approve it um, if you spend all your time making your list you're still not in, in competition for money to no, do of course projects. of course that makes sense and you can always submit a revised priorities list and a revised project list you can do it every year if you want to but like as <laughs> Je as jeff was saying guilford and you have said you've mentioned too right that the state is mainly looking at the list and like the costs and so on and I mean, what Jeff was saying, right, is that the, the state could approve a project that's like number 25 or number 26. So like even if Eve and I and, and Bruce, the subcommittee continue to refine our, you know, is project A like scoring higher than project B? Like if, if there's general agreement that all 20 of these are important, using the, our code of general criteria, we don't need to initially build out like everything related to the scoring. Um, in part in the plan that's submitted right there'll be two priorities whether the money is I mean, coming from the town or the money's coming from the state okay i mean because the uh, i mean if a state is going to approve project number 25 or something tracy, it, you know, tracy i don't think you need to get into this oh yeah anyway right now right because the idea is the consultant is going right. to do that and guilford has said that the consultant can come yep. talk to the subcommittee right so we that's can great. have these kinds of conversations later okay. definitely Does that make sense Makes sense. Thank you. All right. Good. Thank you. That, that's that's exciting. Something to look forward to. So, I mean, I, it seems like something that other people at the TAC might want to just say, yes, we approve or we agree. That's great or something. Yes, that's great. Um, and <laughs> I'm expecting that um, <laughs> that well uh, one of the, one of these one of these uh, when we get down to this number nine. Uh, on the agenda and subsequent meetings that there'll be more. 
Yeah, updates. Bruce. I, I concur. I think this sounds like a good plan. Um, I don't know that we need to, we need to take a motion on it. I, I, I don't know. No, I, I think you've got consensus. Yeah, I'm going to go without objection or whatever they do when they say that in the in the, the big house. Um, Bruce. Are we ready to adjourn or is there anything more? I, I oh, no, there's something more. Kim. No, I second the adjourn. Oh, I, <laughs> no, Bruce has to say it first. Oh, Tracy. Well, I, <laughs> I, I I had a like 30 second or 20 second item as well as maybe like a minute item. Okay. Um, all right. So my 30 second item was just at the end of last meeting. I had asked about um, the sidewalk shoveling and like how if we had updated anything, um, you know, in terms of from when Amherst was a town to when it, now that it's technically a city and we can charge more for our fines and Lo and behold, those were actually updated in 2019, um, but there I was still referencing a part of the website on like snow removal and so on that had like the ten dollar. So that was, it's already been done. And I I'm TSO said that they might look into like in terms of the extent to which it's enforced and so on like that because I have to say there are some pretty impassable sidewalks and that would be great to see. Um, I did just have another question that had come up. I, I know that um, the um, Myra Ross and the Disability Access Advisory Committee has been talking about this a little and just generally thinking about roundabouts, but also about Triangle Street. And um, it seemed I wasn't on the TAC then and you know I wasn't involved in reviewing the project at the time, but there had been some um, there had been discussion with the Disability Access Advisory Committee and Guilford back then, like before the construction, that talked about, um, I know that Nate Malloy had like written up a summary email of one of the um, Disability Access Advisory Committee meetings to Paul and to the select board, um, just um, where it was talking about that the after the construction was done on the Triangle Street roundabout, that there would be um, a study or some evaluation about like how well the um, how well the intersection is serving pedestrians and so on, and looking at like if any retrofitting would be done. And I think Nate's comments um, they mentioned that there was some conduit that was laid that could potentially handle um, pedestrian signals or something if that was something that the town wanted to pursue later. So Tracy, I think that's more of a discussion and maybe is an agenda item for. No. Next well, can we have a discussion about that perhaps? And if there are any updates, get them at that time. Yes, I did not want to discuss it in full. I just wanted to like raise the question because it had come up at the- And the question meeting. is a little bit more about disability access and the history of the Triangle Street Roundabout. Is that correct? And that about um, like um, since construction, you know, it has, has there been consideration about like pedestrian access or, evaluation of pedestrian safety issues at that intersection. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I was gonna say that, that could also dovetail with the discussion about Pomeroy Lane, because it's the same issue, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, inter they're pretty different intersections, but yeah, there are some overlap there. Yeah, so the, dis the discussion detail dovetails, but I'm not sure if the design for the two intersection does because of, the, because of the crazy angle that- uh, Yes. That's that's a huge problem, yeah. Yeah, a challenge. I we hated that the slip lane back in the day already. So, um, thank you, Tracy. Bruce, I, I to <laughs> and th thank you, Kim. <laughs> we will see you uh, all in two weeks. Stay well. Good luck in getting those shots, man. Mm. I don't know, yeah. and. Uh, I thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.